take two. <laughs> I, uh, my previous recording, I cut off the top of the board, so we're doing it again. Anyway, so here we go with cardiodynamics, right? So this is a relationship between changes in heart rate and stroke volume. Stroke volume and how they correlate with changes in cardiac output, usually measured in liters per minute. Right? Heart rate is in beats per minute. Stroke volume is usually measured in milliliters, which of course we can really convert to liters. Now, the reason I list or have an arrow here to stroke volume from EDV and ESV is because stroke volume is really the difference between the two, right? And so uh, we have mechanisms of adjusting EDV alone, mechanisms that adjust ESV alone, uh, and then of course we're gonna come to one where changing EDV actually directly affects ESV. So, right, and again, cardiac output is highly variable. Um, we need to change it based upon need. Um, the, the easy example is during exercise when we need to move more blood flow. And so we're gonna see how uh, altering these two variables uh, combine to adjust cardiac output based upon need. Now, EV, <coughs> you wanna think of essentially, so end diastolic volume, right? So it's the volume that the heart fills with prior to its, the ventricles, sorry, fill with prior to their contraction and ejection, right? And so we describe the, the load on them, the, the amount of distension of that, of those chambers, the ventricles, as preload, right? Meaning it's the load, the stretch, let's put that in quotations here, Before, on the, the cardiomyocytes before they contract, before they're stimulated to contract. And there are multiple uh, variables that play into determining this preload. And they include, and now you can see it, heart rate. Um, we have uh, factors that affect blood volume, the amount of uh, blood that's actually in the circuits. So we'll put that here. And then the last one, We'll put down here as the muscular pump. They all really relate to venous return to the heart. I, a lot of people like to use that venous returned term um, with the muscular pump, but the, and basically because those in this scenario the, the skeletal muscles uh, squeeze the veins that pass through them during their contractions and compress that blood and drive it unidirectionally back to the heart. So the more the muscles contract, the more venous return goes up, the more stretch and preload we have, and EDV goes up. And that just makes sense, right? Because EDV going up would make stroke volume go up. So if more blood comes back to the heart, we need more blood to come out of the heart through a cardiac output, right? Now, okay, so that's fairly um, simply explained there through the actions of the skeletal muscles. But let's go look at uh, blood volume. So if blood volume goes up, the venous circuit has high compliance, a uh, very important term. It's the inverse of elastins, which the arteries have. Uh, and the compliant, the high compliance means it has a, the potential to give a lot. And so if, you, if blood volume goes up, most of that extra volume ends up in the venous circuit, portion of the circuit, right? Yes, it's moving through, but the greater volume sort of distends the venous vessels and accumulates there. Um, and unless it stays there, but it, their vo the volume of the venous circuit goes up. Now, what that means is that central venous pressure goes up a little bit. Again, compliance, high compliance keeps it from going up much, but even going up by a few millimeters of mercury means we've enhanced the driving force, the pressure gradient, that moves blood back to the heart. So if <clears throat> blood volume goes up, central venous pressure goes up, if central venous pressure go up, goes up, the driving force that moves blood back to the heart goes up, increasing our stretch, increases our EDV, and ends up with a, we end up with a larger stroke volume. Now, uh, heart rate, how's heart rate tied into this? Well, if we pick a direction to change our heart rate here, uh, if heart rate is uh, lower than normal or than typical, then you have longer to fill during each cardiac cycle, and longer to fill means venous return goes up, like overall, not the rate, but we have more time to fill, more stretch, same scenario here, right? Very high heart rates actually tend to diminish that because we, we tend to reduce the filling time 
And it can become limiting at really high heart rates, can become limiting where EDV would actually tend to start to come down because we don't have enough time to fill. But we're talking about heart rates in that uh, scenario of you know, 180, 190 beats per minute, very fast heart rates. Okay, so that's our preload, uh, the amount of stretch. Now, again, if EDV goes up and if ESV were to stay the same, stroke line would rise. Okay, so that, that explains the parameters we just talked about over here. Having said that, increasing EDV does cause EDV to, or sorry, ESV to change. So I want to put an arrow between these two. Right? What that basically means is that the more we stretch, the more we optimize the degree of overlap between the thick myosin filament and the thin actin filament. Well, the amount of over the, the range of overlap determines how many cross bridges you, you can get. And so the, sh the short story here, the short version of the story here is that the more stretch optimizes the amount of overlap. The more optimal overlap, the more cross bridges, the more cross bridges, the harder it contracts, the harder it contracts, the less blood there is left behind, ESV goes down, which makes stroke volume go up, right? And that was Starling's law. Starling's law of the heart. And basically what it's saying is that, well, EDV is going up because of all these things, but basically because of the mechanics of how tension is developed in striated muscle, it's going to contract harder too, right? So we not only fill more to get stroke volume to go up, but we're going to contract harder because of it, making ESV go down, which also makes stroke volume go up, right? You want, if EDV goes up, that's good in terms of stroke volume. If ESV goes down, that's good because the difference is your, is your stroke volume, okay? Now, we can affect stroke volume directly, right? And the agents that affect stroke volume directly are called inotropes. Right? And there are positive and negative inotropes. Most things tend to be, the majority of them, uh, factors here are positive inotropes. And inotropes affect contractility at a given preload. In other words, the stretch thing is separate. So most of the inotropes, all of the inotropes, act by increasing positive inotropes, by increasing the uh, amount of intracellular calcium. Calcium is tied to uh, exposing the thin filament to the binding sites on the thick filament, the myosin heads. So the more calcium, the more binding sites we get at a fixed degree of overlap, and we get a harder contraction. Harder contraction means ESV goes down, which means stroke volume goes up. Right? And our inotropes uh, include norepinephrine, uh, neuro, uh, neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, right? Epinephrine, epi, which is uh, hormonal from the adrenal medulla, those sympathetic, right, mediators. Um, we could probably throw in the thyroid hormones there. They tend to uh, be positive inotropes as well. Um, <clears throat> the other key factor that uh, can affect ESV is what's called afterload. Right? And afterload is, think of it as the resistance to ejecting the blood, right? So if blood pressure is high, then it's difficult to open the semilunar valves. We have to spend more time isovolumically contracting, which means we spend less time ejecting, which means ESV would go up, right? We would leave more behind because we eject less. If we eject less, right, what we eject is stroke volume, so stroke volume would fall. So high afterload uh, is a bad thing, right? We, there's a given amount of afterload in general because the pressure in the arteries just flow through the arteries. We can't have no pressure there. Um, but having abnormally high pressure would be bad. Now, it's also tied to the resistance, right? The, the pressure determines sort of how hard it is to open the door, the semilunar valve, to start ejection. The resistance sort of determines how readily the blood moves as ejection occurs. So it's really, it's really both. Some people want to call afterload just straight up blood pressure, and that's simplifying a bit too much. It's blood pressure and the resistance of the arterial circuit. Okay, those are our factors affecting um, stroke volume. Now let's look at the factors affecting heart rate. And here we want to, I'm going to add two arrows, affecting heart rate, because 
as opposed to the inotropes, right? We're going to call these chronotropes because they affect heart rate, rate, right? Chrono refers to time. Um, but in the inotropes, it was, these are both sympathetic mediators. There's not a lot of parasympathetic innervation of the cardiomyocytes. Remember, contractility, altering stroke volume, is adjusting things at the cardiomyocytes. Adjusting heart rate only at high. Uh, X, uh, or is, can only be affected at the um, nodal cells, right? And so in that scenario, the innervation is both sympathetic and parasympathetic. It's pretty, pretty balanced, right? So we've got that, remember the scenario of driving with your foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. We tend to, we tend to have both of these active. We just sort of adjust one relative to the other. And so I'm going to put sympathetic on one side, norepinephrine, parasympathetic on the other side, that's our parasympathetic neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. The sympathetic tends to be stimulatory to heart rate, put a plus sign in green, green for go, right? And the acetylcholine would tend to be negative, uh, a negative effect, a negative chronotrope um, on heart rate because it would slow heart rate. Now, who adjusts the balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic? Well, that's the central nervous, uh, central autonomic nervous system. And it doesn't make this decision sort of on its own, right? It has to receive input that says that something is, you know, out of whack, right? And so really um, the input comes in basically two varieties, right? Three if you count the proprioceptors that, you know, your body your body's movement telling you that you're, you've started exercise. They also play in here. But the two bigger players are really the baroreceptors and the chemoreceptors. Right? And so the baroreceptor, baro for like baro, like barometer, like uh, is a indicate pressure. And they're found in the aorta and the carotid arteries in your neck. Um, and then there's also a, a sort of a low pressure or more of a volume receptor in the large veins at, or the atria, both actually. <clears throat> so those pressure slash volume in the venous and the things, the veins in the atria, sense the degree of distension or tension in the walls of the, of the uh, cardiovascular circuit, right? And so if pressure is too high, Right? Oh, let's give you this one. Right? Remember blood pressure. If you saw Purcell's law for blood pressure, blood pressure equals critic output times resistance. So if pressure is too high, right, we would want cardiac output. This is too high. Then we want this and this. Right? We want cardiac output to come down, which means we would want to, if pressure's high, we would want to remove sympathetic output and add parasympathetic make heart rate go down, make cardiac output go down, make blood pressure go down, right? And just the other way, if blood pressure is too low, we would, right, we would get input to the ANS that says, ooh, we need to jack up cardiac output, make heart rate go up. And of course, um, <clears throat> we would get input to inotropes as well, right? The sympathetic, you know, epinephrine is circulating around, can go anywhere, so it's also gonna act on the cardiomyocytes, right? So you do have both happening at the same time, inotropic and chronotropic effects, but keep in mind, inotropic effects occur at the cardiomyocytes, chronotropic effects occur only at the nodal cells, right? We can only alter heart rate uh, at the nodal cells. All right, um, the chemoreceptors are found in some of the same places, aortic arch, the carotid sinus, uh, also up in the brain with chemoreceptors, and they sense CO2, O2, and H plus. And remember, the CO2 and H plus go together. If carbon dioxide goes up, you produce more protons through the carbonic acid equation. Uh, we're going to do more of that in the pulmonary system. Uh, O2 is it's also sensitive to O2. Ten, they tend to be most sensitive to carbon dioxide, actually. Um, but if you think about this, right, if there's more carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide floating around the bloodstream, we would want to get that to the out of the tissues and to uh, the site to, to uh, get rid of it, exhale it at the, at the lungs, right? So we want to move more blood. So again, higher cardiac output or lower oxygen or higher H+, remember these two will go together, would indicate increased metabolism, which would indicate that we would want heart rate to go up. So guess what? 
high CO2, low O2 stimulates sympathetic, inhibits the parasympathetic, heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up. Okay. Our blood pressure would go up a little bit maybe. Um, resistance might go down to compensate for increased flow to uh, exercising tissues, right? So this, this could answer here, could stay the same, but our cardiac output goes up, which means blood flow to the lungs goes up. So we get rid of the carbon dioxide and we get more oxygen, right? Solving the initial problem that the chemoreceptors detected. The last uh, input to heart rate would be hormonal, right? And again, it's going to be epinephrine, Right? Remember, norepinephrine is not a hormone. It's a minor hormone, so we usually leave it off. You can list it here if you want to. Uh, the adrenal medulla releases mostly epinephrine, 75-25 uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. <clears throat> um, and then we can also put the thyroid hormone here again. And we can do that up here, right? T3, thyroid hormone. They tend to both be uh, uh, inotropic and chronotropic. And again, same sort of mechanism. Well. Let's get at that mechanism, right? We're adjusting the nodal action potential to do this. So let's look at that briefly before we wrap this up. Let me erase this guy, make some room. If I draw a nodal action potential here, and a couple of them actually, and I highlight this area right here, which would be the same as this area right here, that's called the pre-potential. Right? And the pre-potential is due largely to IF, right? I for current, F for funny, the funny current. And so <clears throat> if we want these action potentials to be closer together in time, we need the pre-potential slope to be steeper. We need to depo depolarize more quickly. Right? This funny current is a combination of both sodium and potassium current. Well, potassium is working against you because potassium is tending to make you more negative. So we know, of course, that the sodium current has to be dominant because our slope here is positive. And again, if it wasn't positive, would you ever reach the threshold of the calcium channel that gives us our action potential here? No, which means you'd have no pacemaker, right? That would be bad. So we need a positive slope here. The question is, is it really positive or is it less so? If we want them closer together, we need it to be much more positive. So guess what? Norepinephrine stimulates an increase in funny current, acetylcholine, slows heart rate, causes a decrease in funny current, dropping that slope. And again, never to zero slope or negative slope, right? Because that would be bad. Um, keep in mind that the funny channels were also called HCN channels. Hyperpolarization active H. For hyperpolarization activated, meaning by becoming more negative here, that opens the channels. In other words, each axe potential opens, or, or sorry, generates the next axe potential, right? It makes it spontaneous. <clears throat> but they're also HCN, the cyclic nucleotide. Well, we came across cyclic nucleotides before. Cyclic AMP is a cyclic nucleotide. So guess what? The cyclic nucleotide binds the funny channel, the HCN channel, and opens it. So norepinephrine stimulates an increase in that second messenger, cyclic AMP, causing the opening of the funny channels, more current, greater depolarization. Acetylcholine causes a decrease in cyclic AMP, right? Fewer funny uh, channels open, a less steep slope here, and a slower heart rate. The action potential is farther apart in time. Okay? And I think we've got it all, right? We've got our, our inotropes affecting um, and preload affecting uh, EDV and ESV, and therefore stroke volume, and then our chronotropic effects largely through the autonomic nervous system. And again, this is also autonomic, except hormonal autonomic in the adrenal medulla. And then we can throw in our thyroid hormones always, right? Again, these are always tied to, these guys are all tied to an increase in metabolic rate, right? These go up when you're either active or stimulating response to cold, in which case you want a higher metabolic rate. In either scenario, higher metabolic rate means a greater need for oxygen. It means more carbon dioxide production means you need to move more blood, right? We want heart rate to go up, cardiac output to go up.